The German film company Ufa is 100 years old. For much of that time, it's been a German brand rivaling Persil or Volkswagen. Ufa wrote film history. What is the essence of Ufa, the great ship that sailed through so many stormy seas in the past 100 years? If I think of Ufa, I think of Germany. It's the Mercedes of production companies. Filming with Ufa was a sign of prestige. It was a melting pot for creatives in Berlin and for the whole world. In 1917, Germany was losing the First World War. General Erich Ludendorff identified the culprit, the new medium of film. The Germans had become a target of mockery in British and French cinemas. Ludendorff wanted his own version, a big film company to produce propaganda for Germany. I regard the implementation as an urgent part of the war effort and I call for quick realization. Ludendorff. Ludendorff. That was effectively the founding charter of the UFA. At the time, there were many small film companies in Germany, each sailing under its own flag. They made cameras, ran cinemas and produced films. But Ludendorff had bigger ideas. The general roped a consortium of big German firms into doing their patriotic duty. Deutsche Bank, Bosch and AEG made funds available. The small companies were to be merged into one proud ship. The Universum Film Aktiengesellschaft, UFA for short, was to conquer the cinematic seven seas for the German Kaiser. Part of the Ufa Empire was the studio complex in Babelsberg. Erich Pommer, a decorated officer, a monarchist and a Jew, became the head of production. He was the almost ideal appointment for the Ufa board, with its German nationalist agenda. The head of state of the young Weimar Republic was Friedrich Ebert, a social democrat. He visited the Ufa studios during the filming of Anne Berlin. Ernst Lubitsch was the director. Ufa stars Emil Jannings and Henny Porton played the lead roles. Ebert wanted to grace the famous company on location with his visit. Reportedly, he lost his hat there, and Emil Jannings picked it up for him, saying, we Majesties have to stick together. I don't know whether Ebert, as Reich president, really liked being addressed as Majesty. Die Nibelungen, a film by Fritz Lang, very German material realized by a brilliant director. This delivered on the promise of producing a German legend with German actors in a German company. We can really sense the national consciousness and perhaps somewhat excessive national pride. It was all innovative, large-scale and expensive, a mix of Krupp and Wagner. The dragon was the technical attraction. Inside it were six men who were notified by Fritz Lang by telephone when the dragon was to spew fire. Soon, 
the Ufa sailed into financial troubled waters. Producer Erich Pommer left and went to Hollywood. Ufa docked onto competitors Paramount and Metro Goldwyn Mayer for financial support. The result was a German American conglomerate, Parufa Mate. The Ufa hoped that the merger would help more of its films to be shown in America. That didn't happen, and its financial situation remained difficult. In 1927, Nazis were fighting in the streets against communists. Unemployment was on the rise. Once again, Ufa, with all its expenses, faced bankruptcy. Deutsche Bank sought a buyer and found Alfred Hugenberg, media czar of the Weimar Republic and an ally of Adolf Hitler. Deutsche Bank placed him at the helm of the Ufa ship. With Hugenberg as the majority shareholder, Ufa moved even further to the right. His first mate, Ludwig Klitsch, was firmly in control of the rudder. He cancelled the contract with the US companies. It had been a huge loss. Now, the artists no longer had control, but the bookkeepers. Ludwig Klitsch built four soundproof studios in Babelsberg, known as the Tornkreuz. He also secured the return of Erich Pommer, who brought musicals with him from America. The future belonged to sound film. Musicians, cinema owners and actors protested. Film 701, Sternberg, Frau Dietrich, 195, Aufnahme 3. But the talkies launched new stars. Director Josef von Sternberg made trial recordings with a little-known actress in Babelsberg. Jetzt aber falsch spielen, verstehst du? Dann gibt's einen Tritt. The Blue Angel was a special film in many regards, not least for the Ufa. A director from the United States, Joseph von Sternberg, was flown in. It was meant as a vehicle for Emil Jannings, but in fact it became Marlene Dietrich's film. It made her a global star. Emil Jannings still acted with his facial expressions, like in a silent movie. Every scene was filmed first in German and then in English. Marlena hired a language teacher. Jannings thought he didn't need one. Do you always know, sweetheart? I think I drank a little uh, bit too much last night. Say, I wish I had your capacity. Die Drei von der Tankstelle, a musical film made in Germany. The new genre helped the Ufa to turn around its fortunes and begin making a profit again. Pommer discovered that these musicals enabled a new export strategy with different versions. You could work on the same sets and tell the same story using different actors in French, English and sometimes Italian. The film addressed the economic crisis of the late 20s, a heavyweight subject, in a lightweight manner. That was the Ufa's trademark during the golden years of the Weimar Republic. 
Und nun ran an die Arbeit. Allez hop, Buso, du arbeitest jetzt noch. The UFA marketed Lillian Harvey and Willy Fritsch as a dream team. They were highly paid and highly controlled, even in their private lives. Sagen Sie, Willi, wenn einer mich beleidigte, würden Sie sich auch für mich prügeln? Selbstverständlich. <laughs> the UFA had an image to sell. And to do that, it controlled or even created the star's personal stories. Affairs, questionable liaisons, were out. Homosexuality, although some of Ufa's biggest stars were gay, was an absolute taboo. An Ufa movie star would soon have to be hard as Krupp steel, tough as leather, a solitary leader like Frederick the Great. In 1930, the flute concert of Sans Souci adopted an alarmingly warlike tone. The end of the Weimar Republic was approaching. Das bedeutet Krieg. Ich werde gegen alle Regeln der Kriegskunst einen fünfmal stärkeren Feind angreifen. Ich muss es tun oder alles ist verloren. Bleiben wir mit verschränkten Armen stehen, so werden wir zermalmen. Es ist also kein Augenblick zu verlieren. The Ufa always had national films in its production plan. That could be a period Prussian film or a film about the First World War. And these films were advertised as national films. What had always been the underlying character of Ufa now came into the open. The Ufa's national films helped to dig the grave of democracy. The Ufa always had nationalistic views. Most of the men on the board and in management had served in the military. This was not a company that aimed to be subversive. On the contrary. Emil Georg von Staus, who had been the first head of Ufa in 1917, introduced Hitler into industrialist circles in the early 30s. Alfred Hugenberg became Minister for Economic Affairs in Hitler's first cabinet. The UFA board sent a congratulatory telegram. The film for the new regime had already been produced. Three days after Hitler came to power, Hugenberg invited him and Vice-Chancellor von Papen to the Berlin premiere of Dawn, a nationalist submarine drama. Goebbels thought the film was very good in parts. He particularly liked the lines spoken by Rudolf Forster. Maybe we Germans are bad at knowing how to live. He loved that, but he felt the presentation of the home front was, as he put it, a bit house and garden, not aggressive enough. During the Nazi period, Ufer was based in Berlin's Kausenstraße. Pressured by Goebbels, the company soon fired its Jewish employees. Ufa's best talents had to leave. Producer Erich Pommer, actor Fritz Kortner, the directors Billy Wilder and Robert Siodmak, actress Elisabeth Bergner, actor Peter Lorre, actor Kurt Geron, and they weren't the only ones. Director Fritz Lang no longer wanted to stay, but Propaganda Minister Goebbels still wasn't happy. He wanted the company's total submission. The UFA does not have the Führer's approval. I order the press to attack Ufa on all fronts. 
Ufa has got a shock coming until it is ours. Klitsch and the Ufa are already softening up and this is just the beginning. Those idiots from the German National People's Party. Goebbels bought up Hugenberg's Ufa shares for a good price. Now he was in charge and could restructure the ship as he pleased. Klitsch could only stand by and watch. Actors, materials, scripts and dialogues. The propaganda minister and film enthusiast now ruled all of this personally. The board didn't appreciate this micromanagement. It saw it as a threat to its business, especially abroad. The view of the Reich Chamber of Film, that the production and sales of films can be ordered from above, continues to fill us with serious concern for the development of our business. Goebbels was involved in writing the script for Wunschkonzert, a clever mix of newsreel and acted scenes. During the opening of the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin, the smart Ilse Werner falls in love with a dashing Karl Radatz. They fall in love, but lose each other. Years later, they find each other again thanks to the Army's Wunschkonzert, or Request Concert, radio show. Zum zehnten Male ruft die Fanfare zum Wunschkonzert der Wehrmacht. Wir grüßen euch und wir erfüllen euren Wunsch. A tearjerker set against a backdrop of war. The message, war is inevitable. Wunschkonzert was one of the most successful Ufa films of the Nazi period. His career also began with propaganda films. Gunnar Müller started acting in film roles in the Babelsberg studio when he was just 12. This was his last interview. I started with advertising films with the Ufa, and then I made short propaganda films with Jupp Hussels and Ludwig Schmitz. If I look at the image of Ufa, it was decorum. All the men wore dark suits, white shirts and silver ties. In Young Eagles, Gunnar Müller played an apprentice keen to build cockpits for bombers. The young Hardy Kruger played an equally enthusiastic role. A propaganda film, pure and simple. Rote Schlachtzeilen in der Presse. Lehrlinge entscheidend an der Produktion beteiligt. Der Rundfunk kommt angetickelt, die Wochenschau flimmert uns ab. Und dann, du, dann kommt sogar Hermann persönlich und drückt jeden von uns die Pfote. Wir waren ja also 16. We were all about 16. I met Wolfgang Liebeneiner and said, when we're done here, I have to go to the Hitler Youth Training Camp. He said, I'll give you a contract. Maybe that'll help. That's how I got a UFA contract. Not because I was such a good actor, but to keep me from military service. It didn't work, though. The board complained that too many UFA employees had gone to war or been killed in action. 600 forced laborers were assigned to the company. They were treated very badly, as was usual in German companies. Agfa-Color. Goebbels wanted to see the world of Ufa in color. The company's art house department had been experimenting with color since 1931. This was Ufa's first color film. 
Next, the animators switch to colour. Compared to Hollywood, Ufa was lagging way behind as far as colour film was concerned. It was Goebbels' personal ambition to catch up. The first German feature film was only made in the summer of 1939. Ufa stuck to its guns even in colour. The film was a period musical with jaunty military personnel and a saucy woman. Sie sollen singen. During filming, it became clear that the color quality wasn't uniform. Certain film consignments varied in quality. Another problem was that one of the lead actors, Karl Stepanik, emigrated to England during filming. He had to be replaced and his scenes had to be shot again. Never mind the regime, Ufa always focused on heartbreak and romance. Henschen Deppe had great material. He wrote the script and submitted it to Ufa. He was asked to come in and was told, we've read your script very carefully and with interest, but please tell us, where in your script is the... He was startled to hear such a word in such a place. He didn't know what to say. He was told, you don't have to show it, but we have to be able to assume that women are there and that lovemaking is happening. All very correct. That was Ufa. <laughs> Veit Harlan made the last propaganda film for Goebbels, Kolberg, a drama with 10,000 extras. Germany, meanwhile, was in ruins. That was the biggest flop in the history of the Ufa. During the 12 weeks until the war ended, this film was seen by hardly anyone. But production costs amounted to several million. Goebbels' motto was better die than surrender. Actor Heinrich Georger says it in the film. For Goebbels and Hitler, the scenes were too realistic. They demanded numerous edits. Two million Reichsmarks worth of filming lay scattered around the cutting room while bombs were raining down on Berlin. The Ufa building caught fire. A secret operation was launched to rescue files and film footage before Berlin fell. The big men at Ufa were leaving the sinking ship. Once the war ended, the glory days were definitely over. The victorious allies decided the company had to be broken up. Each occupied zone of Germany would see small film boats floating again. In 
In the Soviet zone, the DEFA was launched. The accompanying dinghy was manned by apparatchiks, ensuring everything was politically correct. DEFA was a communist version of the UFA. UFA was a studio in which films had been made from the initial idea to the premiere. DEFA adopted the same system. It created a huge institution with two and a half thousand employees where a film could be made from its inception to its final release. The biggest chunk of UFA's assets was in Babelsberg. The Soviet military government ensured that production soon started up again here. Wolfgang Stauter was the first to film in Babelsberg after 1945. Der historische Moment. Film Nummer 1, Szene Nummer 1, Aufnahmetag Nummer 1. Murderers Among Us is the story of a Nazi mass murderer. The Soviets approved of that, and the old Ufa lived on in the workmanship. When I think of Hildegard Knef entering the story as a concentration camp survivor with her bright face in direct lighting, I can see very clearly that Defa had taken on a lot of the Ufa style of lighting. On the other hand, I can also see that with the ruins everywhere, elements of expressionist cinema from the Weimar Republic found their way into this day for film. That's no surprise either, because the set designers who worked on the first day for film were part of the old guard at Ufa in Babelsberg. They'd worked with Fritz Lang and the directors during the Weimar Republic and of course the Nazi period. They salvaged what they could and put it into DEFA. The showdown when the traumatized soldier holds his former captain to account is grand old Ufa cinema. 36 Männer, 54 Frauen, 31 Kinder, Munitionsverbrauch 347 Schuss. Ja, was denn, um Gottes Willen, da war doch Krieg. The Ufa studios in Tempelhof were in West Berlin and therefore under the control of the Western powers. They were more hesitant when it came to rebuilding the film industry. Zur Eröffnung des neu gegründeten Filmclubs in der Schlüterstraße in Berlin hatten sich alliierte Offiziere und viele bekannte deutsche Künstler von Bühne und Film eingefunden. Lil Dagova und Erich Pommer. Der einstige führende Uferproduzent, jetzt amerikanischer Filmproduktionskontrolloffizier. Er hat die Aufgabe, die Filmarbeit in der US-Zone wieder in Gang zu bringen. The film policy of the Allies was aimed at destroying the industry for political reasons. They wanted to smash the Nazi legacy, while at the same time keeping this market open for American productions. The Allies banned Kohlberg and other propaganda films. Today, 20 of the 300 Ufa films from the Nazi period can only be shown with restrictions. The files from the burning Ufa headquarters had ended up in Weserbergland, the hills north of Hanover. The agenda at Wagenholz Castle was the refounding of the Ufa. It's a story like a harmless little film, but one with bite. At first, former Ufa staff came to Wagenholz, acting as if the company still existed. They had letter paper printed. They advertised for film editors. In the films and on the posters, they had the swastikas painted over and covered. Abracadabra, suddenly all these films were denazified. Things got exciting in the castle cellar where the files were stored. The Allies commissioned trustees to sort out the finances. A young man studied the files down here. He was supposed to help liquidate the company. Arno Hauke did the opposite, defying the will of the Allies and with the help of the Adenauer government.
Die Adenauer Regierung, aber auch die großen Fraktionen des Bundestages. The Adenauer government, but also the major parties in the Bundestag, viewed film as a medium for shaping opinion. Dieses zu beeinflussen. I think influencing public opinion was a crucial aspect of the early West German film policy. At the behest of the Allies, the German parliament passed a law in 1953 intended to break up the UFA. But Chancellor Konrad Adenauer found a loophole. There were exceptions to the order to break it up, and those exceptions were implemented. It wasn't sold to the highest bidder. Originally, there was a rule that no one was allowed to buy more than one studio or three cinemas. But exceptions were possible. The buyers took advantage of all these exceptions. They were explicitly encouraged to do so by the government and by the parliament. Hermann Josef Abs, the head of Deutsche Bank, got a call from the Chancellor's office. Adenauer sold Ufa to Deutsche Bank for a third of its value. It was a good deal for the bank, just as it had been when Ufa was first launched. Thanks to Adenauer and Deutsche Bank, Arno Hauke became the captain of the new film ship that in 1956 once again bore the big old name. A ship meant to serve the German government and Deutsche Bank, just like in the old days. Hauke opened new Ufa cinemas, and he moved Ufa from Warenholz to Dusseldorf, where he built up a new headquarters. He distributed and produced movies. Ach du meine Güte, hat sie schon wieder rausgeschmissen? Bin von selbst gegangen. Gerade heute haben wir dein Bett abgezogen. Na, Mutti. Grüß dich, Axel. Wir setzen wieder. Gunnar Müller played the son of Luisa Ulrich in Ufa's first post-war film. They were the new Ufa dream team. Gisela. The capable businesswoman, widow and mother of three sons, overcomes all the hardships. And then she even finds new love. The film with Gunnar Müller could have been made for the Adenauer government's family ministry. This film isn't Mama Fabulous, it was a slip-up really. I was lambasted in the press because when the great Ufa releases its first film and then it's such a trivial entertainment movie, they shouldn't have done it. The film was a flop, but Arno Hauke, the company captain, was unfazed. Ufa is like me. It has strong legs. Nothing will capsize it. Hauke's next project was an expensive international co-production. The young Horst Buchholz, nicknamed Hotte, was discovered by the Ufa and by Mario Adorf. I heard that Buchholz didn't like me or want me. We met on a plane. He sat down next to me and said, I'm sure you've heard that I've got a problem with you because of the character of Lossky, and I want to tell you why. When I read the script, I imagined someone like Spencer Tracy in that role. I replied, he's a man I very much admire. And I can also tell you that when I read The Death Ship, I imagined someone like William Holden in the lead as Philip. And he said, one point for you. 
I'm hotter. The death ship was way above average for that time. Physical, radical, dirty, hard cinema. Schmutziges, hartes Kino. Hört sich an wie Brandung. The Ufa banked on action and young talent. Good cinema, actually. But Germans were getting comfortable in their television armchairs. You could say it failed because of the expectations. They wanted to continue on the model of the pre-war years, the golden age of the Ufa. They wanted to be just as good and as successful, but that didn't work. Ufa celebrated, despite millions in losses, until it became insolvent and was sold by Deutsche Bank to Bertelsmann in 1964. The federal government paid Bertelsmann a lot of money to keep the rights to the old Ufa films in Germany. That's how the Murnau Foundation was established. It maintains Ufa's cinematic heritage to this day. Bertelsmann sold the Ufa cinemas in 1971. Although they were still called Ufa afterwards, there was no Ufa left inside. These days, the old logo can only be seen on three remaining theatres. If you deal consciously with your history, and I think we do, if you know the dark sides, but also the great sides of Ufa, then it's a proud company legacy. It's a real legend in the film industry. I can't think of any other in Germany that had such a long film production history. There are very few who can claim such a long creative output. Thanks to Nico Hoffmann, the Ufa ship has once again become a well-oiled machine. Ufa now earns its money with shows and soaps, but high-gloss event television restored its reputation. Meine Herren, vergessen wir nie den Segen, den das Chloroform in die Operationssäle gebracht hat. Beim Militär habe ich noch Operationen ganz ohne Narkose erlebt. That's the Ufa tradition. Period dramas. From the German Empire to the fall of the Berlin Wall, the new Ufa has told the story of almost every major event. Here, halten Sie die Haken anständig, Tischendorf. It was a purely private Nico Hoffmann move that the big high-end dramas were always big historical stories. I'm very interested in these topics. I feel that I've now finished telling those stories because I've done so much in this area. It was very much shaped by us, but also by my private interest in German history. The miniseries Generation War moved the Ufa ship out of its comfort zone. Schicken Sie das an die Adresse, die drauf steht. It tells the story of five young Germans who experienced the war, not by choice. Tom Schilling is one of the young soldiers. Er, er greift sie an. I'm really proud of the film. It's unassailable in my view. What could be better than when films cause controversy? I've always made films with Ufa that were so captivating and compelling that you really had to think about them and talk about them at work. The series also portrays Polish anti-Semitism during the war. Większość z nich to Żydzi, a Żydzi są tak samo parszywi jak komuniści czy ruskie. 
lepiej martwi niż żywi. The blurring of the lines between victims and perpetrators angered the Poles, not to mention the public in America and Israel. One thing I wouldn't repeat with Generation War is that I now wouldn't go to another country and, as a German filmmaker, try to tell parts of Polish history from the German perspective. That belongs to the Poles. I've learned my lesson in that area. Or maybe I'd bring in Polish historians to act as consultants. But I wouldn't do it like that again. Generation War was nonetheless an international, critical and ratings hit. The International Emmy for TV Movie Miniseries goes to... The International Emmy Awards are the Oscars of television. Generation War. Ufa is a piece of German history. Empire, Third Reich, Federal Republic. It always knew Germany's dreams, fears, hopes and longings. That's been its business for 100 years. What is this here? Laura, Macht's gut. Bis dann. Danke.